A big thank you to our sponsor, iFixit, who fights for your right to repair and makes really cool tools in the process. If you need to fix your phone, laptop, or even a vacuum, iFixit has thousands of parts, tools, and free guides. Mercury, Mercury Stardust. She's a beacon of hope in the darkest night. Mercury, Mercury Stardust. She'll teach you how to make it all alright. Hey there, hi, my name is Mercury, and I'm the trans handy ma'am. My pronouns are she, her, and I teach compassionate DIY. We're here to help renters, LGBTQIA members, and anyone who's feeling left out in a DIY space. Hey guys, gals, and non-binary pals, thank you for tuning in for yet another episode of the Handyman Podcast, a Handyman hotline, I forgot the name of my own (laughs) show, (laughs) where we answer your questions when you call in or you text, and we have a doozy of a wonderful episode for you today, but as always, I'm joined by my amazing co-host, the absolutely extraordinary Miss Meggy Conrad! (laughs) <laughs> Maggie, I can tell Matt, for the love of God, turn off the music. <laughs> Is that puppies? Yeah, hold on. Aww. Let me do my bit. I had a really good bit planned, okay. but the bit, the sound went too long. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Maggie, the audience is going wild for you, okay? <laughs> okay, that's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. Now we can start the episode. This is a bit, Maggie, that honestly, I feel like we should call quits at this point. Yeah. It is so wild. <laughs> I feel like anyone who's listening to the podcast for the first time, the first five minutes of the show, they're like, what the fuck is they're happening? They're like, who is this person she's talking about, yeah. and why are they going crazy? Yeah, why, <laughs> is it the, why are there dogs in the podcast studio? That seems like... A not very smart idea. Or when trains and rockets and dogs and cats. <laughs> fireworks. Just, it's just a fireworks. It just seems like a lot to have <laughs> in one studio. You know what I mean? Okay, Maggie. That being said, how was your week? What are you doing? Um, Good. I want to say thank you to Ziggy for helping us get the questions to the podcast. She is our new executive assistant, and I absolutely adore her. And she's keeping the energy and the positivity, and it's super fun. God, I'm excited. I, lo- I love Ziggy. Ziggy's been such a wonderful asset Yeah. Um, as it is. And, yeah, I'm really excited about answering these cues with my A's today. Uh, <laughs> and for those, for those who don't know, uh, we had our, our book just came out recently yeah. on pre-order called Safe and Sound a renter friendly guide to home repair and we have been ranked number 3 on Barnes and Noble mm-hmm. we have been ranked as high as number 6 on yep. Amazon and number 1 on bookshop.org which is a huge um huge big deal for us so I want to say thank you to everyone who's pre-ordering a book we mm-hmm. I think by the time this podcast comes out we will have officially hit 10,000 I think so too. pre-sold we're at 9,000 I think it's very easy to say. Also, yeah. the reporting of you know uh, of the, the sales is always a little bit harder, especially mm-hmm. when we have so many smaller shops that are reporting in too. Yeah. It's not just Barnes and Noble and Amazon; it's a lot of smaller stores across the country. Yeah, it takes some time so to get those you're orders. Gonna, you're going to have more inconsistency and a little bit harder to count when you got so many different orders across the country and the mm-hmm. world. The world, by the way. A lot of people across the, uh, the world are buying the book as well. So I want to say a big thank you to everyone who's doing that. You're making this worth my wild. And you're also telling a lot of the people who said that this was not possible. Mm-hmm. You're showing them really early that this they were wrong. So yeah. thank you so much for that. Okay, without further ado, do Maggie Conrad, are you ready to start the cues? <laughs> God, this show is so <laughs> stupid. I don't know. I feel like I'm I'm living my shitty DJ life. Like uh-huh. I'm like living vicariously through like my my that the, that the little kid who you would stay yeah. up at night listening to those crappy DJs is like so excited about the you know the life that I'm living right now as mm-hmm. a podcaster. You know, and all the sound effects and the silly oh, things. Yeah, I absolutely. <laughs> I wanted to be the guy from Police Academy. Oh, you know that's what I'm talking? So cute. Yeah, oh my god, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, anyways. 
let's not load make, up that cue. Let's not make any more references <laughs> that will date how old I am. Okay, let's go. Hello, Mercury. My name is Colleen Day Them, and just wanted to say first, I love the name of your show and you, and I laugh every time I hear Trans Andy Man. I'm calling because we've just moved into a house, and they did a very slipshod job on painting the entire thing. So I'm looking for some general tips, uh, places to really look out for. Just I haven't painted a wall in years. I'd love any of your insight on it. Thanks so much. You're a delight. Bye. Well, hi there, <laughs> Colleen. Thank you so much for asking that good question. I love paint questions because I did that like every single mm -hmm. day for years. So love it. First and foremost, Maggie, do you have anything you want to add before I just like rip open this door of of paint stuff oh my gosh <laughs> i mean i think you're the pro more than me i have definitely helped paint walls um but i i would defer to you on this one okay oh wow way to put the, all the pressure <laughs> right on me okay really quickly uh what we want to do when whenever we're doing anything painting we want to prep the wall and when we say prep we mean like sand the wall mm -hmm. i cannot stress enough how much a bad sanding job will affect the wall down the road, okay? So think of it as the more the, the, the better you sand, the more likely the paint will adhere to the wall. So if you're having an issue where the paint is being rejected, mm, peeling, yeah. and et cetera, often it can be linked to one or two things. It can be linked to uh, sanding not being done or uh, primer not being used. And those two things can help a great deal. So absolutely make sure that you are uh, doing that. Make sure that you are um, sanding it down. Now, I like to get those rounded, like, sanding, like, wheels mm -hmm. that put a, a piece of, of sanding paper on it. And then add my extension rod to it that I would for a roller. Oh, sure. And then I just go on the wall. Those are the best way. I love those a lot. I have, I've had one of those for years. Um, you can get a lot. You don't need to sort of sand it down to the bone, right? right? You don't need to go all the way past the cardboard. You don't need to go all the way past the paper. You can just sand off it a little bit in order to get it a little bit more rough around the edges that's going to actually accept that paint, right? It's and, and this is really true for anything that has a sheen to it. So anything above a satin would absolutely, you're going to want to... You know, your semi-gloss and your glosses. You mm -hmm. need to because otherwise it's going to repel whatever you, you're you Oh, doing. true. Yeah, the glossier it yeah. is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The sheen itself is definitely, even eggshell in uh, even satin, those two can still be a pain. Mm -hmm. Not as much as a semi-gloss or a gloss, but they can, you know. Um, the flat is the one that does, you don't need to do shit to half the time. The flat <laughs> is just going to accept everything you throw at them. But. Those are the things I would say right off the top of the bat. Now, the next part when we're talking about painting is that everyone thinks that they know how to roll a wall. And then I see people roll a wall, and then it's quickly apparent that they were taught things mm -hmm. when they were younger. Or they roll the wall like they're just painting or whatever, but they're not actually doing it in a way that is going to be more efficient. So we want to make sure that we're not doing the X, okay? We're not painting a fence, okay? When you're painting a wall, you just want to add, you want to get the wall with that primer right away. You want to just throw all that on real quick, saturate it with the, with the roller, and then make sure you get an extension rod with the roller. Don't just bare hand the <laughs> roller. I see people do that a lot, and that gives my back an ache just looking at it, right? So make sure you add an extension rod to the roller. And then you, you saturate it, and you do everything in about three to four foot sections. You do four feet at a time, right? You layer it on, and then you do something called ladding off. And mm -hmm. ladding off is when you go straight down a wall. like, And we're talking straight down the wall, but applying pressure um, one in one direction, mm -hmm. okay? So you're applying direct, uh, pressure on one side of the roller so imagine that you're going down you got two wheel you got four wheels on the wall if you're a truck okay and that truck is going down straight down the road okay what i'm talking about is adding that pressure on one side i'm talking all of the wheels that are on the left side of that truck 
are being pushed down on. Mm -hmm. We want that to be pushed down on, okay? Now, keeping with the same analogy, right, I then, once that one line is done, I want to go just about six inches in. If it's like a a 9-inch roller or a 12-inch roller or anything like that, I want to go about six inches away from what where I just did and overlap a little bit, mm-hmm. okay? So if we're going down the street in a truck, I want somebody, instead of being right alongside me, I want there to be another truck just behind me, you know, and in the center of where my rear view mirror is. So they're not necessarily directly behind me. They're a little bit off. And to, to to my side, but they're still seeable in my rear mirror. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And yeah. then they're going. I'm going straight down that path, and they're a little bit like three or four inches going down my path, but then mm-hmm. making their own path. But and here's the very important part: when you're doing that line, when you are making that line that we're trying to drag across the wall, each time that you're going down it and you're moving that six inches farther down the wall you need to keep applying the same pressure so though so now that i added my wheels on the ground real nice and tight right you're going to come in there and add the same pressure on the same wheels going in the same direction does that make sense mm-hmm. so now what you're doing that line that's being created there's a line down the wall now where you obviously brought the roller down harder than the other side you're then going to overlap it and add in another line, and that's going to feather off the line that you are covering up, and then you're dragging that line farther down the wall. That kind Does of that makes make me, sense? Yeah, it kind of makes me think of like when you're cleaning a windshield or a window and you're using a squeegee. Yes. And every time you use the squeegee, there's a line yes. on the left side of it, and then you got to erase that line and make a new line, and erase that line yeah. until you get all the way across. Uh, to the edge and there's no more lines. And the reason why that matters, right, is for directional lighting. Mm-hmm. So when you're when you're looking at a wall, right, and you haven't done lighting up, mm-hmm. you can see a lot of the lines, a lot of the strokes of mm-hmm. the brush or the mm-hmm. roller, right? But when you're using lighting off technique, you're dragging that down the line and you're covering up all the other lines a little bit mm-hmm. or enough if you do it in a way that really works well with the wall that you won't see it in the light, okay? The best way to do it is wherever that light, so let's say the light is coming at you um, from the left side. You want to light off toward, like, the same direction the light's going in. Mm -hmm. So the light's Mm -hmm. coming from the left side, you're going to go towards the right. So if you have a big window on the left, you're going to start on the left and do that process to the right side. If you go the opposite route, that light, no matter how well you do, especially the higher gloss you go, mm-hmm. right? If this technique is easily done in eggshell, satin, semi-gloss, it gets more difficult when we're talking about gloss. So if you're going, if you're using gloss and you're going against the grain, mm-hmm. then you're essentially, you're going to see every single stroke that you added to the wall. Hmm. If that makes sense. But yeah. that that is another technique that I will throw out there that I think that ladding off changes everything. But do it four feet at a time. Mm -hmm. so you're essentially doing you're adding all the paint you're getting the wall nice and saturated then you're lighting off and then you're adding more paint to the next four feet and then boom boom, boom, boom. and then once you're all done you want to move fairly quick you don't want to take too much time on this because the longer you take the more it will dry and the more Mm -hmm. it dries the lack of play you're going to have right it's not going to be the the paint's not going to be flexible anymore and it's going to already dry by the time you're done with the oh, wall sure. itself yeah so you want to make sure you get it on there and then you want to go back over once everything is done but again got to move fast right and then the same thing with your finished coat but if you did that with every single layer that you're doing you're going to have a much cleaner like more you know, like a much cleaner and much more polished look on the wall than you would otherwise mm-hmm. and then there's one more step I, I i just i'm sorry <laughs> if i'm getting so carried away with the painting today i just really love painting yeah. a lot there's something called cutting in okay this is mm-hmm. when you use a three inch angled brush you want the bristles you want to use are nylon nylon is the best for latex painting and you want to get that three inch angled brush Typically, I like a purdy. I think purdies are pretty decent. They're not the best brush on the market, but they're available in most mm-hmm. places. 
and I want you to get like a hand pail bucket, something you can actually hold in your hand, not just a uh, a gallon of paint, a, an actual hand pail, typically one that has a magnet on the thing so you can hold your paintbrush. The handy in. pail. Yeah, the handy pail is really good. I like that one a lot. I use it in all my products, mm -hmm. all my projects. And you're going to want to put just like maybe like a quarter of paint in the bottom of the pail and then push the bristles of the brush down in there. You want to get as much paint up inside of the brush, mm -hmm. and then you're going to want to wipe one side of the brush off, okay? Typically, uh, this, the, the, uh, the, the high side. So the side that's going to go up against the ceiling. Right. Right? Well, you don't want paint. You don't want paint on that, right? right? So make sure that whatever direction you go into is going to be the angled section, right? So the lower point of the bristles are going to go the direction in which you're going in, right? You're not going to go the opposite direction. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. So if you got a like a a 30 degree angle, you're going to go towards that 30 degrees rather than away. So make sure the top side of that brush is free of paint and then that paint that's inside of the bristles that you pushed in there, that's going to come out nice and well, like it's going to push <laughs> up against the ceiling. And make a nice crisp line um, and not work against you. If you just do the tip of the paintbrush, you can do a, a decent job, but it isn't going to be as crisp. You can still mess up. The way that I'm describing right now is how the pros and everyone yeah. does it. It's a much quicker way to do it. It's usually a much more crisp look. If you need to, uh, don't risk it and use painter's tape. But frog tape is my preferred painter's tape because frog tape has a better chemical that can reject mm -hmm. it more but you got to make sure that when you are applying frog tape you're doing it in an even way mm -hmm. that it you know if you're doing sections of frog tape which i always recommend doing like three foot sections of frog tape don't just try to do one long strip do three foot sections of frog tape but overlap them and make sure that line that you're creating is even and consistent all the way across always you're going to have issues and then make sure you press down on the side that's going to take paint. Yeah. Yeah. And then the best thing to do is just go right over top it. Just paint right over top it. And then you'll have a really nice crisp look. Did, is that good? Yeah. That was very thorough. And I wish I would have known more about the cutting in before we painted our hallway a couple <laughs> months ago. <laughs> I love. Because you could see my mom. My mom is really good at cutting in. You could see where she did the cutting in. You could see where we did the cutting in. Because it's just, it looks so bad. And I'm like, I really wish I would have like. You know, I should have talked to you before I, doing that. You know what I think it is? I think <laughs> painting is the one DIY thing that everyone thinks they can do. Yeah. And everyone thinks that's really easy and simple, but they don't realize it's, it's very actually... technical. It is very technical, but it's also one of those things where I just told you all that. I guarantee mm -hmm. you're going to go and do a fine job. Do yeah. you know what I mean? If yeah. you just knew those things, it would be so much better. Mm -hmm. Like, you, I, I don't even need to show you that. And yeah. I think you got... You got so much out of what I just said. I think most people could do an instantly better job at painting. But mm -hmm. because we think we know how to paint, we don't even try to ask how to paint. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But we know how to paint. You're like, oh, things. just paint in a straight line. You'll be just fine. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think it's one, of, it's one of those barriers of education I think that proves a lot about people. Mm -hmm. Is that like, all because I'm a professional does not mean I don't have a bunch of books for beginners yeah sure i just bought a bunch of diy books this weekend at barnes and noble where it's like i i haven't seen these books in the market i got some popular mechanics mm, um books cool. i'm re i love popular mechanics and I, I i'm excited about learning stuff that i haven't known and i will share one with you later mm -hmm. on that's fucking awesome i'm really i don't know if i shared the post-it one no okay i'll share Can't it with wait you. to learn about it i'll share it with you and uh later in the podcast it's gonna blow your mind but all that being said those are the tidbits i will give right away for painting the last thing i will say is that you're only going to keep things clean and avoid from paint if you properly prepped mm -hmm. and removed everything in the area yeah i remove everything in the area i mean everything and if you can't move it then that's when you add in your your like four or six mil plastic mm -hmm. over the top it and really really do a good job with that and don't do one mil or two mil do a minimal of four mil mm -hmm. that's a thicker plastic yeah. and that's going to be better don't trust me when i say 
pla- old plastic is not created equal. Mm-hmm. And if you buy cheap, you will get cheap results. You don't want it to leak through that plastic. It is a di- and trust me when I say that if it leaks through the plastic and you don't notice it while you're working, oh, yeah. it seals the air in there. Oh shit! And then it makes sure it adheres. It it's like it becomes a heat gun mm. underneath it, and all that friction underneath that plastic just pushes that paint right into the floor, and you'll never get it out. Mm. Like it is a disaster. Carpet. Yeah, I've done it to carpet. Oh my god, getting paint on a carpet is a nightmare. <laughs> you can fix it, but it's rough. You can use acetone and hardwood floor, but you will never. Mm. Like, you'll mess up that hardwood floor. You know yeah. what I mean? But you can do it. But you get, if you're on concrete, you're pretty much good to go. <laughs> you'll, you'll get It's going to be a kind of beat up, but it almost is going to look natural. But anything other than concrete. Yeah, splurge and get the thicker plastic. Yeah, splurge. But the canvas material is my favorite. Mm-hmm. Make sure you get the canvas material that has plastic underneath it. That mm-hmm. is the way to go. If you're going to do it more than once. Getting that canvas material that's like five to ten feet in uh, length, mm-hmm. and then making sure that you have plastic underneath. That's the way to go. Always go heavy duty. Better safe than sorry. That's my mo. Okay, good. Did great. That was a good one. Very thorough. Very thorough. We started the podcast with a lot of technical information. I'm sure everyone is listening. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. So this is a message from Callisto. I live in a really slum apartment and the wood lining has just broken right off the kitchen entrance. How do I even find those wood bars to replace it? I've asked my landlord and they won't fix it or help. I'm not sure how to specify, but they're the wood lining you'd see at the door entrances. And I have a photo for you. We're talking trim, right? Yep. Or, we're talking trim? Um. Oh, we're talking transition. Transition. Oh, yeah. okay. So we're talking on the floor. I don't know Between why. Between the tile and the ha- and the hard wood. Okay, cool. So you're talking about a, tr- is, uh, is it called a transition pad? I think it, I don't know. Hold on, Maggie. I think so. Okay, Maggie is going. The word, I had the word in my head, but as soon yeah. as you asked me for it. Yeah, it's I called, it's called a transition. <laughs> so we're talking, that was going into a, ki- a kitchen? Yeah. Kitchen and a, li- a dining room, or yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very common to see those transition rails or whatever. Yeah, the, the kitchen yeah. entrance. Okay, Maggie, you were going to buy me time, and I'm going to Google this up, okay? Maggie's going to do a noise or tell you a story. or I'm sure it's going to be very fascinating. And the whole time, Maggie's not going to panic. Maggie's going to hang in there, and she's going to do a great job <laughs> as I make sure I get the information right. And we're going to start this right now. I feel like at this point, it would be easier for me to look it up and have you riff. <laughs> Maggie, you gotta keep going. Uh, Maggie, you just I'm... started. You just started, Maggie. Come on, give me at least 20 seconds. I, I thought we were just gonna have Matt cut this part out. No, we're keeping this in now. We're keeping this in now. I apologize to anybody listening. If you haven't heard from previous episodes, uh, putting me on the spot is not usually the way to go because my autistic brain just shuts the fuck down. Um, I really don't have anything. I'm sorry. Maggie, I swear to God. <laughs> but you know what's so funny, Maggie? This is why I'm not a content creator. <laughs> you are, though. You're literally on a podcast right now. Yeah, but like as as support, right? <laughs> Maggie, you're killing me. Give me like 10 more seconds. I'm so close. I'm making sure I get this name right. Um. Uh, so speaking of puppies, I have a puppy at home and he's super cute. He's a bull mastiff. And he's four months old, and we were afraid he was going to be like 130 pounds. But after going to the puppy class, now we realize he's probably going to be smaller than that. So yay for not 130 pound puppy. Transition <laughs> strip. Transition <laughs> strip. That's what it is. It's called a transition strip. Maggie, that's all I needed. That's all I needed was you to talk about a puppy. Okay? I feel like, Maggie, you are a mother. You should be talking about your child all the time, or you should be talking about the puppy you just got. Okay? I feel like those are your go-to. Children and puppies. Okay. Children and puppies. But, okay, all the joking aside, we are not... <laughs> this is the most dysfunctional podcast we've done. And that says a lot because I would say a good 50% are dysfunctional. <laughs> uh, okay. That being said, this is called a transitional strip. Okay. Uh, transition strips are pretty much available at any hardware store in America. Mm-hmm. Is it going to match the one that you showed me? I don't know. Was this in an apartment? Is that what it was? Yeah. They, well, they have uh, a landlord. Yeah. 
you might not get it to match. Uh, you probably just have to rip the rest of it up, right? Because yeah, it looked like it was only part of it was missing. It's really hard to know. And now, how do you adhere it? Usually with a nail gun. Yeah. And you use like uh, wood putty to cover up the nail hole typically. Or sometimes you don't cover that nail hole up. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know what? I actually just had this happen at Chester's place. Chester, my partner, uh, had uh, a transition strip that was doing the same thing at the, end, at the top of a stair. Mm, right mm -hmm. and if you don't do anything about it you'll just snap that thing in right in half yeah so doing something about it earlier rather than later is the way to go and in this instance i think you do your best to to match it right you can always measure how the length is and then when you're at the hardware store you can ask them if they are able to cut it and typically they will cut it and then charge you for the length that you actually bought Mm -hmm. okay and that might not be the case sometimes it's different but you could get lucky especially if you don't really have a car and if you're like on a bus or something, you don't want to bring oh, like a yeah. ginormous transition strip on the Six bus. Six foot strip. I know, <laughs> but sometimes, most of the time, they're eight. So most of them, they're eight oh, feet yeah, long. Oh yeah, that's true. So even if you have a car, it can be difficult. I've yeah. I've I've driven my car before with like uh, like um, wood sticking out of the yeah. you know the passenger window, you know, but it's in the back seat. I've you know, um, my old car back in the day, I had an Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra, and I put I had a whole bunch of two by fours. I had in the back seat and it was like maybe like six foot like six eight feet it was eight Mm -hmm. feet because it was the length of my car inside and i was like oh i don't need to put like a blanket or anything on these to protect the front window (laughs) i'll be fine i was 19 years old you'll go into a job site slam the brakes on behind a car crack that window it didn't go it didn't go through that window but it like shattered like the whole front window besides just a little section just just looked like it got cracked, like Aww. just shattered inside. And I was like, oh, that's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, so bad. I, uh, I just wanted to save time, and all I did was cost myself so much money $400 down the mm. window like that. But, anyways, back to the transition strip. Uh, I think that that's what you end up doing. And then you either take some like little tiny framing nails mm. and you use that, and you just pound them in with a hammer, or you rent out a nail gun, and you do that route, and that should be good to go. I think that's it. I, I don't think there's much more to that yeah. one. Am I right? Did I miss anything with that one? No. I mean, I think that's pretty much it because if you, you wanna... just have to make sure it's big enough to, you know, you want to match the size yeah, and the width, cover the gap. Make sure you get the d- dimensions as much as you yeah. can, you know. Um, bonus points if you decide, you know what, I can't find it at the hardware store, so I'm going to have to take the other one off. If you do that, bring it with you mm-hmm. or bring a piece of with you. And then the person who's helping you at the hardware store, if you need help, will definitely yeah. give you some guidance. And the last thing I will say to that, when you're removing the other one, a trick you're going to want to do is put like try to lift up the end a little bit. Right. Like mm-hmm. with a flat head, but try not to damage the wood or the, the carpet or anything like that. Try to put like a flat head underneath it. Get it up on an angle a little bit and then add in like a towel. Yeah, and add in a towel, and then you can add in a flat bar or some type of like breaker bar. You don't know what I'm talking about. We're just talking about basically different kinds of crowbars, mm-hmm. and you put that right underneath the transition strip, and then you can just bend it, and then that will take the whole thing almost right up for you. It is a very easy way to do it, but adding that towel there mm-hmm. prevents damage on the floor, sure. and you'll be surprised how easy it is to scratch up. So you stuff you put you... the towel underneath the crowbar. Yeah. So that your crowbar isn't directly touching the tile. Yeah. And if you need, a, if you're having a hard time, if you're like, and also be, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be clear here. The cr- I would not use a crowbar per se. Right. I would use a flat bar or a breaker bar, which are different types of crowbars. <laughs> but I know when you say crowbar, you mean yeah. like, you know, you're the, one of the bad guys from a 101 Down Nations and you're trying to break someone's ankle <laughs> with a crowbar. You know what I mean? Not that guy. You know, this is a different, it's, they're shorter. Right. Right. But if you're having a hard time and you're not getting it to, like, pull it up a, a much, right? Like, if you need more leverage, you can put, like, a block of wood underneath it. Like, put a towel underneath the, the base where you're mm-hmm. adding the, the ply. And then you're adding, like, a lever. You know, you're kind of making it a lever to give you some, some more leverage to pop it up. And that right. usually does it. So, there you go. I think we did a good job. Yeah. I hope we didn't mess anything up. 
And if we start, if we steered you in the wrong direction, thank you for listening. My name is Maggie Conrad. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Just keep throwing me under the bus. Yeah, today's the day, Maggie. Maggie's today's getting day. run over. Yeah. <laughs> and not to toot my own horn, but toot, toot. It's the Maggie train. Okay, next question it is. Hi, Mercury. My name is Gwen. My pronouns are she, her, and I live in South Carolina with my wife. I've been following you for a while, and I really appreciate your advice and the way that you, like, bring this kind of learning to us everyday lay folks who don't quite know what we're doing but are trying. So we just moved into a house that was recently renovated, and we already noticed a few things that aren't quite right. We got a good deal on the house, so we're feeling good, but there's just a couple things that need to be addressed. So we're trying to get to them, like, one by one. So... The issue that I'm running into now is our primary shower, uh, bathroom shower works. Like the water turns on, but when you turn it all the way to hot, it's only like lukewarm. So in the winter, it's not that cold in South Carolina, but um, it, it it's a little chilly for a cold shower. The other shower and the sinks and everything have hot water, no problem. It's just this one. Thankfully, we have a second shower we've been using and hobbling our way back to get dressed so it's just this one any idea what's going on and how to fix it there's no access panel on the back so i don't have like easy access to the back of it um would love any ideas that you have to help us thanks so much for all that you're doing and we're just sending so much love your way from south carolina thanks bye-bye well hi gwen i hope that you are doing really good thank you for such a good question <laughs> maggie before i jump in here mm-hmm. do we have anything you you want to add before I jump in here? Because the last two, I just like, I completely steamrolled you and pushed you in front of a bus. So I want to <laughs> just, give you the just opportunity. don't ask me to, to yeah. riff at all. I'm going to be okay. I, well, I'm not asking you to riff. <laughs> I'm just asking, do you have anything you would like to throw in here before I like. The only thing that I know, and you can tell me if this is correct, is that usually there's like, sometimes there's a hot water regulator inside of the handle. Yep, you're killing it. All right, I did it, Maggie. I just <laughs> want to tell you that you are. I, 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 a, I actually. I, this is why I ask you, because a, Maggie's been a homeowner twice over now, mm-hmm. and Maggie's also a very knowledgeable person, but never gives herself enough cr- enough credit, <laughs> which I think a lot of women do. Like a yeah. lot of women, a lot of trans people, a lot of queer people, we don't give ourselves enough credit. And Maggie on this podcast, weekend, week out, kind of shows up. <laughs> and fucking kills it every week and never gets enough credit. So I just oh, want to give credit where credit due. And then this is me <laughs> giving you credit after I push you in front of the bus <laughs> twice in a row. Okay? So this Appreciate that. Is, this is making sure that after this podcast. Pick me up off the ground. Thank yeah, you. I want to make sure that after this podcast, you're not resigning as my business manager. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to make sure. Okay. That all being said, the very first thing I'm going to check, even though. Gwen said, hey, you know, all the water is hot everywhere mm-hmm. else. I'm still going to say just to be safe here, because sometimes when you're in a shower, things feel like they're even colder mm-hmm. than when you're in, uh, you know, in the kitchen sink or in a bathroom sink or anything like that. Right. So I would still check your hot water here heater and just make sure it's not set to a low temp. Right. Right. That's the very first thing I would check. Then, then we want to make sure that there is, like Maggie was saying, there's like a regulator inside of your handle, okay? This is called either a stem or a cartridge. A cartridge is typically when you have one handle mm-hmm. for the whole shower, okay? You can turn it left or you turn it right, and either direction is going to get you the temperature that you desire, right? Now, sometimes it's a knob, sometimes it's a handle, either way. Now, a stem is typically associated with a single handle or a single knob, right? So that's mm-hmm. when you have a single knob that's only for hot mm-hmm. and a single knob that's only for cold. And the reason why those two things are different is because stem has been around for a long time. And the stem is kind of like a, a thing that hides underneath your knob that is re- not necessarily regulating, but it's, it's helping control how much hot water mm-hmm. or how much cold is coming out, okay? Right. And how much um, is that going to be released, okay? Over time, those stems can get beat up, and they don't operate as much, and, or they don't do as good enough a job. Mm-hmm. Typically, mm-hmm. it is the opposite, where they're fucking boiling hot, 
not <laughs> lukewarm. So the, maybe, maybe that's what this is. It could be either a stem or a cartridge. Kind of the same thing with either. Cartridges are a little bit, um, like, if this is a cartridge and a single handle, which I don't think it is from what G- Gwen has talked about. Yeah, they didn't specify. No, they didn't specify, but the way they spoke about it made me feel like it was a knob situation mm-hmm. and not, like, a single knob for each temperature. Right. And not a Oh, not yeah, because she said you turn it all the way. Yes. Um, yeah. And it, to hot, but it doesn't get hot. Yeah, that's why I yeah. was like, I think we're talking about stems. Mm-hmm. But just in case, if it is just a single handle for both temperatures, very common for the cartridge to go bad. Because inside of it, right, the cartridge will go bad and not be able to regulate. Like it's almost opening up. It'll be opening up the cold while it's opening up the hot. Oh, sure. And if that's the case, if this is a single handle, single knob situation, definitely replace your cartridge. Okay. Now, either way, if it's a stem or a cartridge, the way you get to it is by removing some type of set screw that's on the handle Mm -hmm. that is hiding the stem or cartridge. Okay. Definitely Google. All of this stuff on YouTube. It's very hard for me to explain where these set screws are going to be. They're often hiding in plain sight. Like mm-hmm. if you're doing one of those knobs and you don't, if you see one of those knobs that kind of looks like a, a star or a snowflake mm-hmm. where it has all those ridges on the side, very classic knob you see yeah. everywhere. There's a set screw that's typically right underneath the middle component. The middle component that has like a logo or has mm-hmm. H on it or C on it. It's that, like a little cap. Yeah, the little cap is, Maggie, you're killing the game. That <laughs> If you take a butter knife mm-hmm. or something on the side of it, right where there's like a crease, it will pop it open and you'll see a set screw right underneath it. People always get confused where that thing is. It doesn't look like there's anything yeah. there because it's hiding it, but that's where it's hiding. And if it's a handle instead of a knob, typically right around the base is mm-hmm. where you're going to see some type of set screw, probably an Allen key. Okay? Now... I don't know how to walk you through all of this on a podcast. (laughs) So I'm going to tell you right now, you should look up like this old house, hot water stem, or this old house cartridge. Mm -hmm. And you should get something that's going to work. Now, the reason why I recommend this old house over other ones is because, A, years and years and years of a back catalog. Yeah. Right? Like if if you don't find something... That is perfect to what you're talking about. Um, you, chances are you're going to find something else. Like, it's going to lead you towards the right direction. Like, when, when YouTube recommends mm-hmm. another option, they're going to recommend something based off of what you're seeing. Right. And that's quality, knowledgeable, and typically, not always, typically it's going to give you a good variety if you look at this old house first. If you start at like just what you're looking for, mm-hmm. you could be getting a crap ton of stuff and maybe a third of it is actually accurate. Okay? So start with this uh, this old house and then work yourself through the other stuff you see on YouTube that maybe might be better for your situation. Okay? Mm-hmm. But start with the basis. And even if you see right away, oh, yeah, this is not for me. I don't need this. Watch it. Watch it because you'll never know what little tidbit that you're picking up from. Yeah. The more you, I always tell people, never watch one how to, watch three. Always watch three different how tos, even if there's different brands, because you'll you'll be surprised when it comes to especially showers. Mm-hmm. They're way more intricate than you. You probably think they're pretty. So one is going to show you something that the other two. Yeah, might not have showed. And it, it could be like a simple little trick, you know, as simple as like the whole thing we we're just uh, explaining about finding the mm-hmm. set screw underneath the cap. It could be something as simple as that, or it could be something more complicated about how to get the cartridge out. But sometimes cartridges get stuck, mm-hmm. and there can be techniques to pull them out. But every brand, it can be difficult. Now, you might have a Delta, you might have a Moen, you might have. You know, colder. There's a lot of different brands of plumbing hardware mm-hmm. that you could encounter. And once you see what you are, like you see these videos, you might get more familiar what brand you're dealing with. And that's going to help you too because then you can find the exact brand match and then get the same, you know, cartridge or stem for that brand and put that one in. So I hope that gets you the right direction. I don't think this solved the problem. 
Mm-hmm. But I definitely think it armed you with enough knowledge to be able at to least solve to know what to look at. Yeah, I mean that's a thing about like doing a, you know an audio version of this. Mm-hmm. You know, this is kind of like car talk where you're listening and you're you're not really positive if they're if they're <laughs> right, <laughs> but it's entertaining. Well, yeah, sure, it sounds good. Yeah, it's entertaining <laughs> to see if they're gonna solve the problem or not. <laughs> um, but I think in this instance, I think we armed you with enough information. And as Car Talk would say, good luck. I don't know. Good luck. <laughs> good luck. Okay, now next one. <laughs> All right. We have Julia. Pronouns are she, her. Um, if I'm renting a house or in an apartment, what can I use if I want to hang up posters or pictures but can't put a hole in the wall or peel the paint? Ooh, always a t- question we get for this podcast. Okay, so they're the, the most obvious one. Is going to be those godforsaken command strips. Now, mm-hmm. Maggie knows I hate command strips, but there's a few things I'll throw out there. Buy the brand, buy command strips, mm-hmm. not off brand something, 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 something. Buy the brand, okay? And don't buy clearance, buy new. And I'm saying all those for a reason, mm-hmm. okay? If you buy clearance, uh, typically they've been there for a long time. And the adhesive is going to go bad. Like, if you buy last year's Christmas command strips. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? Have you, if you've ever done that, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> they don't have as much adherence to it. They're a little bit beat up. Yeah. You don't want that. And the next thing is going to be uh, make sure that the brand, because the brand the command really is in command of this market. <laughs> They're really good. And all the other ones more likely to rip more mm-hmm. likely to tape now when you remove a command strip don't take the tab off when you're apply when you right. first apply it make sure the tab stays on the tab is how you take it off and you don't pull you like take the tab that you have attached and you pull away you don't pull against does right. that make sense you that not- releases you're trying to stretch out yeah. the adhesive Rather than uh, pull it up, you're not you don't want to rip it. it like a band aid. Yeah, you're not ripping. It. Yeah, imagine when you have a band aid on and you're trying to like stretch it away from uh, the larger part of it, rather than pulling it straight up. Do you yep. know what I mean? Yep. And I, that's what you're. That's how you release it. Now, a few other things about the command strips before we move on to another way to do this is command strips are also typically okay for drywall. Typically. However, if you're in a shower mm-hmm. where there's going to be high humidity and high heat, the the chemicals in that command strip is going to react differently, and they're going to adhere that to the paint to the wall. There's no way you're going to take that off without damaging it. Mm-hmm. Maybe you'll get lucky, but if it's on there for a year, chances are you're not. Mm-hmm. And if you ha- if living in a space like if if you're going to put it somewhere where there's going to be a direct light source or sun source on it. You're melting the adhesive to the wall, mm. right? Like if a sun is coming out and you can see some of the command strip or in the area of the command strip, it's just heating that area up mm. through the, the glass and through that sun. And that's going to make it be a fucking nightmare to take off the wall. So I want people to be mindful that command strips are not the end all of be all of the options, yeah. right? There's also sticky poster stuff that like stuff that like um, mm. it almost looks like clay. The sticky tacky stuff. That sticky tacky stuff yeah. is an, another option. Um, my favorite option, and this is where I get into yelling at landlords. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And we always have one question every podcast where Ms. Mercury tirade against landlords. But I'm gonna say this because it makes no sense to me. I do not know why pitcher rails are not universal yep. in every single apartment in America. Yeah. In every dorm room, in every apartment, in a- everywhere. Because it's a permanent fixture that you yeah. can then hang whatever you want to from it. For those who don't know what a pitcher rail is, a pitcher rail is kind of like, it looks like it's chrome trim, essentially. Mm-hmm. It looks like it's trim, but yeah. it's like maybe two feet underneath the ceiling. Mm-hmm. So it's like eight feet up, eight, nine feet up on the wall. And it has a little bit of an edge to it. And it has like a little bit of a groove inside of it, the part you can't really see. Mm-hmm. Like from the bottom, it just looks like normal railing, like normal trim. But then on the top of it, you grab a ladder and you go above it. Right. You'll see that there's like a groove that's all the way across. Well, with hooks, the mm-hmm. proper kind of hooks, um, you can hook that in there 
and then in the rail and then hang stuff on the wall. Yeah. And they make picture railing hardware that goes right in there that keeps it nice and sturdy. But then it just it drapes on the wall and it doesn't add any damage to it. Mm-hmm. And it looks kind of fucking rad. Yeah. You know, I, I will never understand why they're not universal. So this question is not what you were asking. <laughs> um, but I do think if you're a landlord or someone who is looking into having, you know, things on your wall, maybe you maybe you want to do some type of like not permanent decorations, but you don't want to keep redoing it all the time. Mm-hmm. Th- pitcher rails. They're also th- the reason why pitcher rails were so popular in San Francisco and in other places that where earthquakes happen yeah. is because of earthquakes. Because, because like they wouldn't fall down. They wouldn't fall you down. Could take them down really yeah, easy. because they would stay stuck into the railing mm-hmm. and they would just sway with it. It's kind of like bamboo sticks in a lot of ways, right? Bamboo sticks are so fucking strong because they actually bend, right? Where like twigs and other, you know, sticks break in half because mm-hmm. they're so rigid. Same thing with it being stuck in the wall. It's so rigid. It's not moving with the sway of it. So when the building is moving with it, the rails are, the, the pitcher rails are just like hanging out. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, okay. Doesn't always work, but does have a higher chance of working. Yeah. So that's what I would say right on top of the bat. Now, other things to, to answer you, I mean, you know, uh, put the hot glue gun at cold. Mm-hmm. It's another route. Take a hot glue gun. You put it on cold, and then you add a little bit on the wall, and then the back of a poster, and that does it sometimes too. Again, you're rolling into dice of how this <laughs> could go poorly for you, but that's the route. I would say if I was a landlord, I definitely don't understand why you shouldn't be putting holes in a wall. Yeah, I'd rather you put holes in a wall than you putting command strips in a wall. Well, and ripping the drywall. Yeah. It's easier to yeah. patch a hole, no? Yeah, because, like, I mean, some people are going to be like, well, yeah, but you can put a hole through something you're not supposed to. Well, or you as a landlord uh, could help them and, <laughs> you know, and make the communication better. And maybe you have a designated area or designated wall mm-hmm. where you can put stuff. I, I Yeah, to answer your question, I think we answered it enough if you're not able to. But I think overall what I will say here is that this is where communication as a landlord should come in. It shouldn't be on the tenant to ask these questions. You should just open it up and be like, well, we don't really want you to do- go anywhere else in the entire area with things. But if you want to have things in your wall, this wall doesn't have anything in it that's going to get damaged. Mm-hmm. It's fairly mm-hmm. safe. There's this section and this section that are great. It's universal in all of our units, basically the same thing. And here's all the, the four studs. Yeah. Anywhere you want to hang your your TV is great here. Don't hang it anywhere else. If those were the restrictions, mm-hmm. every motherfucker would do that, right? Everyone would, re- would respect it. But because we say you can't do anything in here, and people are just gonna do what they want. Yeah, anyway. they're gonna do what. They, yeah, because it's <laughs> unrealistic. You know what I mean? It's unrealistic to say that to not have things on your walls mm-hmm. at this point. Okay, I don't mean to go on my <laughs> rah, revel, revel. You know what? I am like an old lady on my porch, and every time I see a <laughs> landlord, you know, you know, without their leash on, peeing on my yard, I get really mad. You know what I mean? Like, Those put damn a, landlords. Get, God damn it, fucking landlords, always peeing on my front lawn. <laughs> Pick up your damn poop. <laughs> Pick up your damn poop. <laughs> <laughs> shit all over the place oh god you know if landlords did not hate me for my book safe and sound a renter's friendly guide to home repair they sure in hell hate me now okay we got one last one one last question let's go this is uh from charlie pronouns they them hey mercury wondering if you know how i can fix this the wood behind is splitting and falling apart need to secure it somehow so the lock is more stable and they're showing you a picture of a door frame uh that is pretty much rotted out it looks like or split be- behind the strike plate mm. okay charlie first and foremost you got a you got a debacle on your hands so now what we're looking at is this is a door frame itself right mm-hmm. maggie yeah this was a strike plate and the strike plate is where the latch goes inside of the yep. door frame in order to keep your door from opening, right. for those who do not know. What we're looking at right now is a door frame that is f- severely cracked in multiple locations, primarily where the, the actual strike plates mm-hmm. are hiding. And it, it's pretty bad. It looks like someone tried to kick in this in. 
It looks like someone tried mm-hmm. to kick. And, and mm-hmm. I think it's interesting that there's two strike plates on here, one directly below the other. And the reason why I think that's the case is because this, instead of fixing the problem, whoever tried this last time, mm-hmm. added in the second strike plate and moved the latch of the door lower oh. or higher and to try to solve this problem. So they mm-hmm. probably took the door off and they put in a new door and added the, the latch higher up on mm-hmm. the door in order to be the solution. Sure. Do you see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, cuz it's not they're they're one on top of the other. Yeah. Instead of if it was the strike plate for the doorknob and the deadbolt, they would be like a good few inches apart. Now, it looks like Yeah, there's a lot going on here. I'm really trying to get my bearings here. It looks like there isn't going to be a solution here that is going to be secure enough. Okay. Okay. All right. This is a long shot. I just, for those who do not know, I just jumped off the podcast for a second and did some research. And the reason why I did that is because this is definitely like, what I'm seeing is pretty bad. Like this is pretty split. Mm -hmm. I would even crest in the, I would say that the door jam itself, Mm -hmm. the whole frame of the, the door needs to be replaced. This is like pretty bad. Yeah. Okay. But if you're the renter, Mm-hmm. And you know your landlord ain't going to do shit because obviously it looks like they haven't done shit to begin with. Yeah. Right? Then I think, then this is a Bondo situation. Mm. Do you know what I'm talking about when I yeah. say that? Uh, there are fixes online that I have found that help you fill this with Bondo. Now, the reason why I say Bondo other over wood filler and things like that is because Bondo, Bondo for those who don't know what that is, is like heavy-duty car mm-hmm. shit. Mm-hmm. This stuff is uh, it here. It's hard. I would say, you know, this door is going to be out of commission while you're doing this mm-hmm. for a couple hours. So if this is your back door or your front door, just be aware you're going to have that sure. door open for a while. But you're going to want to add that bondo in all of it. Mm. You add it in there. Fill in all the holes. You add in all the holes. Yep. And then um, wherever the strike plate is supposed to be mm-hmm. matching that latch. Then you're going to want to make sure you carve up the hole again. Like maybe you try to avoid where the hole is supposed to go. Mm-hmm. and But fill as much as you possibly can. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And that's going to help like, hear it and uh, give you some strength. It ain't going to be the solution of the year. But there are how-tos on this that I have found online. Like how to fix a damaged door frame. How to fix a damaged do- door jam. Hardware for damaged door frames. There are uh, fix an ugly door jab. All this stuff. All this Mm -hmm. stuff. Same thing. Same thing. And there's one last option that might make it even easier than the Bondo idea. And that is called your door jab repair armor kit. Mm. Okay. Now, I'm going to show this to Maggie because she's better at saying these things typically than I am. But Maggie, this is what we're talking about. It's a strike plate that is 24 inches long oh, with the I hole see. in the right location. Now, what we're doing here is extending it. Mm-hmm. So right now, there's all this screw damage, all this cracking damage at one location. Right. There's two strike plates that are just being shoved in there to try to solve the problem. Take all that off and then put this long one in there. Pre-drill the holes. Mm-hmm. Like pilot hole those pilot hold them so you don't crack further because with the damage that is done to that door jam already it's very likely that if you put a screw through here you will further make the problem the crack worse. Will get worse it will yeah but if you use a if you pre if you pri- pilot hold or, or pre-drill it you're less likely to do it so go slow yeah. don't go at high speed go at slow speed and let the drill bit do the work and then you can add in your drywall screw or whatever screw this comes with, okay? And then you should be good. I think that's going to solve the problem yeah, for that, you. that looks, because it basically just, you know, all of the problem is in that one, like, six-inch area. So yeah. it just extends the plate beyond yeah. that so you can drill into solid wood. And it really does look like one yep. long strip of metal. Yeah. That is going to, and, and, and there's like four or five options for where the screw goes. Mm-hmm. And there's several different brands and there's several different routes. 
and there's going to be how tos on that specifically. Yeah. So that I would great. definitely go that route. That that is a good solution. I I like that better than a bondo one. So mm-hmm. um, we're going to pretend I never said bondo, <laughs> and we're going to go with that. Mercury was right. <laughs> all right. Everyone's well, gonna I, nod. I think the bondo is a good backup if for some reason I, you can't find one that fits your door jam I, or it I, doesn't I, end up working. I think bondo is a good one in the situations where you don't have much of an option. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's my that's my thought process. Okay. But yeah, this extra long strike plate, that's pretty cool. I didn't even know yeah, that I've, those existed. I've seen them one other time when we had a tenant that uh kicked open the door because mm. they locked themselves out. And a coworker of mine went oh what are we gonna do and i was like i don't fucking know I, <laughs> uh, you know it, it was pretty bad but he went out and he got something that looked like that and it worked yes. it worked it was actually arguably stronger <laughs> yeah. than it was before sure um but yeah this is why i always say that like as a professional even yeah. right like never rest on what you think is the best solution look for it mm-hmm. always do the research every job you ever do should no matter how many times you've done the job, every single time you step into a room, it is uniquely different because it's a different room. Mm-hmm. It has a different trauma attached to it. You don't walk up to a person who, you know, their parent passed away several years ago and assume that they because you had that happen to you is the same situation. Right. You would never do that, right? It's the same thing with a building that has different trauma and lived in experiences. Every building, every room, every unit in an apartment building is going to have experienced different things, Mm. different wear and tear, and is going to operate differently with different solutions. So walking into there and thinking that this is how you're going to solve the problem Mm -hmm. is an instant way to get yourself in trouble and (laughs) cause worse problems. So instead of projecting what you think the answer should be, look for an answer that works best. And sometimes... You find new things that didn't exist 10 years ago when you were yeah. doing your job. Yeah. You know, and that, this is me preaching to the technician <laughs> side. All right. Because I can't tell you how many times I've done a job with someone who's like, you know, been around for 30 years. But then they were just like, yeah, you know, we got to do this and we got to mm-hmm. do this and we got to wrap it around with duct tape and some spit and we're good to go. And you're like, there's um, a better way to do that. You know, um, <laughs> yeah, flex tape is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I hate flex tape. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I think that's good. I think we we answered all the 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 yeah. cues. Okay, I want to say a big thank you to me for doing all the work today. Uh, <laughs> I really appreciate it. But as always, a huge big thank you to my wonderful co-host Maggie Conrad for tolerating me and also <laughs> um, faking that she likes me. I appreciate you, Maggie. You deserve your paycheck every week. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to our wonderful sound engineer, the amazing Matthew Allen Hag. Um, and as always, I want to say thank you to everyone who's listening to this podcast. You can call or text us at this number. 608-205-8768. And you could be on the next episode of the Handy Ma'am Hotline. And as always, remember, you're worth the time it takes to learn, learn a new skill. Bye-bye. The theme song for the Handy Ma'am Hotline was written by Rody Walker. The questions were picked out by our production assistants, Ray and Basil. And the sound was engineered by Matthew Allen Hag. Thank you for listening. See you next time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Handyman Hotline, you can listen to an even longer version by supporting us on Patreon. If you support us on Patreon, $10 or more, you'll be able to get an extra long 30 to 45 minute section every single week. Isn't that amazing? More of me and Maggie. Wow! So thank you so much for all those who already support us, and you too can support us and listen to more on our Patreon. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us keep the pirate ship alive by supporting our sponsors, the wonderful iFixit. They fight for your right to repair and makes really cool tools in the process. If you need to fix your phone, laptop, or even a vacuum, iFixit has thousands of parts, tools, and free guides to make your life a little bit easier. So grab your hammer and nails and paint your nails if you want to. You're worth the time it takes to be you. She'll teach you how to fix your house, how to fix it by yourself. The trail.